Can you see my screen? Yes. Okay, I think we're gonna go ahead and get started. So welcome everyone. My name is Harpreet Paul and I serve as the Network's Academic Chair of Pediatrics at Hackensack Meridian School of Medicine and also Chair of Pediatrics at Cahope Nanian Children's Hospital. Uh, thanks so much for attending our amazing event today. We're gonna to be talking about pediatric sleep disorders and uh, we do wanna thank our partners at the NJAAP. Uh, it's really going to be an incredible session. The speakers you're going to hear from are some of the experts around our country in pediatric sleep disorders. Uh, you're going to be hearing about atypical presentations of sleep disorders, uh, how to address and screen children who need a sleep evaluation, and also um, how sleep disorders affect children who may have developmental and behavioral uh, concerns. Uh, our speakers include today Dr. Pake Nagai, uh, who is a pediatric sleep medicine physician and pulmonologist at Joseph M. Sanzari Children's Hospital. Uh, we've got Dr. Chi Tan, who is a uh, pediatric pulmonologist and sleep medicine physician at Cahove Nanian Children's Hospital. And Dr. Stacy Smith, who is a um, pediatric neurologist and uh, sleep medicine physician at JFK University Medical Center. Please put your questions in the chat or in the Q&A function, and we'll get to those at the end of our presentation. And uh, <clears throat> the session today is going to be recorded, so you should be receiving a link with the recording after the session. So with that, you are going to be in for an exceptional treat, and I'm going to turn this over to our speakers. Next slide. So we will start off by talking about normal sleep, then move on to sleep hygiene. Then we'll touch on a couple of sleep disorders such as obstructive sleep apnea, narcolepsy, restless leg syndrome, restless sleep disorder, and then finish off with autism spectrum disorder in sleep as well as melatonin. Next slide. All right, my turn. So, um, so sleep-wake cycle is thought to be determined by the interaction between the two processes, which is the process C and process S. Process S is the homeostatic sleep drive, uh, while the process C is the circadian rhythm that we have in, uh, in our body. So the homeostatic sleep drive is directly determined by the duration of wakefulness. The longer you're awake, the higher the pressure to fall asleep. And the circadian rhythm operates independently of the duration of the wakefulness because the cycle is kind of fixed um, with a deep in the alerting drive uh, towards the evening. So when you um, start to feel sleepy with a high sleep pressure in the evening with a decreased alerting drive from the circadian rhythm, then you fall asleep. Next slide. So how much sleep do kids need? So the American Academy of Sleep Medicine and the American Academy of Pediatrics have recommended uh, teenagers to have at least eight hours of sleep a night, uh, grade schoolers around nine hours, preschoolers 10 hours, toddlers around 11 hours, and infants uh, between 12 to 16 hours, even though their sleep, total sleep time may vary. Next slide. In regards to napping, newborns take several naps a day because they basically just kind of like feed and sleep. And uh, sleep should start consolidating around six months of age where they should be uh, sleeping through the night then. And then by nine to 12 months of age, they would consolidate their naps to about two naps a day and starting to have like a one longer nap in the late morning between 15 to 24 months. And most children will stop napping around five years of age when they start school. Next. Um, hi, everyone. This is Dr. Nye joining you from the North Campus of HMH. Um, so when any of us go to sleep, we go through these sleep cycles as shown here. Um, and this whole picture is uh, known as a sleep histogram. And this one covers uh, uh, an eight hour duration of sleep if you're fortunate to get that much. And you'll see that an individual sleep cycle is composed of non-REM, then REM sleep. So for us adults and children older than five years of age, a sleep cycle um, takes up about 90 minutes. And so for a newborn, their sleep cycle duration usually starts out, starts out around 50 minutes and then uh, builds up from there. Uh, next slide. So for this first sleep cycle, 
you see that there's a progression of non-REM1 to non-REM2 to non-REM3 sleep stages. And this non-REM sleep stage three is also called slow wave sleep, which is that deep, uh, more restorative sleep. It's also true that um, state, that's the stage when growth hormone is released for those of you who evaluate for short stature. Next slide. And this slow wave sleep is depicted in the, in the first two sleep cycles of the night as you see uh, these open blue banners. Um, so you get that deep sleep pretty early in the night. Next slide. And you'll notice that REM sleep makes its appearance very briefly in the first cycle. And there's this red arrow that points to the, uh, some appreciable REM sleep in that second sleep cycle. Next slide. And later on in the night, REM periods occupy a greater part of the nocturnal sleep time. Um, this is why there's a greater amount of recall of dreams, but also, unfortunately, which we'll get into later, why there's also a higher risk of uh, breathing problems, such as sleep apnea, um, during the second half of the night. Sorry, I was muted. Okay. Regarding sleep disorders. So you may uh, observe that different sleep disorders may present at different age groups. Uh, during infancy, the one that we get most worried about is sudden infant death syndrome. Um, that's why I encourage like uh, safe sleep practices, uh, like back to, sleep, back to sleep for infants. And then during toddlerhood, when their tonsils are not starting to get uh, larger in relation to their airway size, then you start noticing uh, more snoring and um, worry about obstructive sleep apnea. Um, that's also around the age where, you know, they start to have some um, behavior issues with settling down and problem trying to fall asleep. As they get older, um, they'll start to have some sleep terrors in the middle of the night and um, around school age, years, um, they may have sleepwalking episodes, nocturnal and reses. Um, and as they get older in their teenage years, um, they start playing on their phone and not wanting to go to sleep, having insufficient sleep, um, having poor sleep hygiene, starting to have insomnia issues, um, their circadian rhythm uh, biologically get delayed and you may see delayed sleep phase. And that's also when you may start to see Daytime, excessive daytime sleepiness um, that could be due to narcolepsy. Next. And in regards to like a presentation at different time of the night, uh, as you heard from Dr. Ngai about the normal sleep architecture. So um, in um, during like a bedtime um, period, uh, you may hear parents complain about uh, settling problems, refusing to go to bed. Um, some teenagers may complain about like restless legs issues. Um, and then uh, in children like with Down syndrome or some neurodevelopmental issues, they may have body rocking um, that soothe them to sleep. Um, so they are kind of like, this will present around like bedtime. And during the first half of the night where you spend most of the night in slow wave sleep, um, you may notice uh, non-REM parasomnia issues like confusion or arousals, sleep terrors, and sleepwalking. And as you have like more REM sleep during the second half of the night, you will notice more snoring issues uh, such as uh, obstructive sleep apnea with sleep disorder breathing, um, and then uh, REM uh, parasomnia such as nightmares uh, and night waking episodes. Next slide. So I made, I'm very much a visual learner. So I made this um, kind of made up a snoozy sheep sleep pyramid just to help visualize sleep hygiene and what can help with, with children getting to sleep and, and having proper sleep at night. This one is just for six to 13 years old or 12 or 13. Uh, I, as Dr. Tan mentioned, different ages have different sleep requirements, but this just gives a general overview. And the reason I made it a pyramid was because having good sleep is a stepwise process. As much as we all want to just, you know, wave a magic wand and help children sleep, you know, it does 
sometimes take some time. And you want to establish a good foundation. So that's at the bottom with step one. And that would be having good daytime habits like being physically active for school age children, not napping after school because that can decrease the pressure to sleep at night, having regular meals and not drinking caffeine. Once you have good daytime habits, you can focus on the nighttime. Step two would be establishing a good sleep environment. So that would be doing a bedtime routine that moves toward the bedroom because you know, children and adults for that matter respond to signals. And it can be very confusing if you go brush teeth, then go downstairs, then go back upstairs and back and forth. It, you know, it really helps to move towards the bedroom. Once you're in the bedroom, you want to have a cool, dark and quiet room, no electronics, which is the big one. I'm um, trying to avoid all that blue light and stimulation and then only using the bed for sleep. And that means I'm um, not doing homework in bed, not doing, you know, other playing in bed. Again, you want to give the child's brain the right signals. And so you want them to associate the bed with sleep, not with something else. Because if you think about being awake and doing other things in bed, their brain really doesn't know when to flip that switch to suddenly say, oh, it's bedtime. So you want to reserve the bed for sleep. Step three would be working on good sleep habits. So that would be relaxing before bed, not doing anything that gets them too wound up, having consistent sleep and wake times on weekdays and weekends. And you can stretch it a little bit on the weekends. Obviously, you know, you are going to stay up probably a little later, but you don't want to do more than an hour or so later bedtime on weekends and same with the wake up time. You don't want to sleep in too much. And then um, you want to do bright light exposure in the morning. So when kids wake up, open the blinds, get them outside just to give the brain the right cues. Next slide. So you've heard some of like the good sleep habits that uh, we encourage parents to follow. Um, so recently the National Sleep Foundation uh, has come up with a consensus statement regarding the impact of screen use on sleep health uh, across the lifespan. So they uh, achieved like, a, so they basically conduct a literature review looking at like uh, all the uh, uh, studies they have done uh, in the past, as well as uh, systematic review regarding the impact of screen use and sleep health. And they have uh, concluded that, that in general, screen use does impair sleep health uh, among children and adolescents. And the content of the screen use before sleep, uh, uh, more so than the light exposure itself, uh, impairs the sleep health among children and adolescents. Uh, that's kind of like consistent with the recent study that you may have seen in the media from New Zealand that was published in JAMA Pediatrics that uh, also showed that the, the content of the media use uh, rather than the, just the light itself that impairs uh, sleep the most. So the more interactive like the, the, the media is, the more problem uh, they may have with their sleep. And they also concluded that behavioral strategies and interventions such as uh, behavior modification, uh, things that you may use to block up blue lights, things like that, and may attenuate the negative effects of the screen use on sleep health. Next slide, please. So, um, so separately, uh, researchers in Australia have uh, done a systematic review and meta-analysis uh, last year on uh, the effects of caffeine on uh, sleep. Um, this is mostly for adults, but it's probably applicable to children as well, especially teenagers. Um, so um, they conclude that the sleep, um, the caffeine uh, does decrease total sleep time, uh, does decrease uh, sleep efficiency, and also increases the transitional sleep stages, which is stage one, um, and decreases slow wave sleep uh, stage three. Next slide, please. So with their uh, meta-analysis uh, modeling, uh, they found that coffee should be consumed at least like 8.8 .8 hours prior to bedtime. Uh, and um, like pre-workout supplements that sometimes can have like a higher caffeine uh, uh, doses should be consumed at least like 13 hours prior to bedtime to, uh, to avoid like uh, um, it impairing your sleep. Next slide, please. And uh, personally speaking, I can attest to 
cutting down on caffeine intake as I've gotten older. Uh, since caffeine metabolism, metabolism does get less efficient as you get older. Um, but back to the children. Um, so how concerned should a parent be about their child's sleep? Um, and in general, I'm glad uh, when parents express concern uh, because it means they consider sleep a priority for their family. And the fact that you registered for the session means that you're looking for ways to optimize sleep uh, for your patients as well. Um, however, as with many things, parents are not exactly in their child's shoes. Um, so at our sleep clinics, we have to tease out what the parent is perceiving versus what the child is living through. And pictured here is my son many years ago, um, and I caught him yawning at just the right time. Um, so this is an example of being a negative role model, meaning what not to do. Um, as you see my son about to fall asleep on the couch, so not his crib, supposedly watching TV uh, with a can of cola. And I'm not trying to make light of, uh, of sleep difficulties, but it turns out that the child, him or herself, may not be likely to complain about their sleep. So even older children uh, may not know better that their sleep could be suboptimal. So instead we have um, parental complaints about their child with observations not only of sleepiness, but also poor or declining sp uh, school performance, behavioral and uh, mood changes, uh, or hyperactivity and uh, inattentiveness. And we get plenty of referrals from developmental pediatricians, uh, neurologists, school counselors, uh, psychiatrists, asking us to look at a child's sleep, um, particularly when diagnoses of ADHD or autism are being considered. So think about it, if you or I get a bad night of sleep, how it could affect us the next day um, with our performance and behavior. But if this is happening to a child and it's bad nights of sleep repetitively, chronically, then the providers would wanna know about this before just prescribing medication or therapy. Next slide. So when a child is at your office, it's not just sleep, of course, that's the sole focus of a well child visit, but for practitioners that have the time and inclination, um, I em encourage the use of this BEARS instrument, which is a short form history taking questionnaire that was dev devised to be a quick but good uh, review of sleep related issues that can be taken up with the family. And it's broken down into five categories starting off with B uh, for bedtime problems. So does your child have any problems going to bed? Um, problems such as bedtime resistance, stalling tactics, or nighttime fears. E for excessive daytime sleepiness. Um, so does your child seem overly tired or sleepy a lot during the day? Is the child sleepy at inappropriate times in the wrong setting, such as at school? Um, and has there been difficulty waking up in the morning? Um, or it can be that a previously alert child has now changed and is now noticeably sleepy at times compared to when he or she was awake uh, in previous months and years. And A for uh, awakenings during the night. Um, does your child wake up a lot at night? Is there difficulty falling back asleep? Um, and are the awakenings like random spontaneous awakenings or the uh, more abrupt uh, and startling awakenings of sleep terrors or sleepwalking or or even nightmares. Next slide. So I, go ahead. What are you crying about? So I did want to show you the, oh, oh, actually go back. You don't have to run it again, but oh, back. So I did want to show you that about a sleep terror as an example of a confused awakening. Um, so my daughter, of course, doesn't like me showing that, you know, uh, which occurred when she was about five. On the other hand, her older brother loves to tease her about it because he never experienced one. Um, so although they typically happen in the overnight uh, sleep period, sleep uh, terrors are not, may occur from a, a nap like this too. So that's why the more appropriate term is sleep terrors as opposed to just night terrors. Um, 
And sleep terrors are usually outgrown by the uh, tween years, uh, but it's a dramatic event. Um, it's a sudden arousal from that slow wave sleep, that deep non-REM sleep I was talking about earlier. And that may begin with a, a scream and then it's a, accompanied by uh, extreme physiological arousal uh, with tachycardia, tachypnea, and, and even sweating. Uh, and then there are behavioral manifestations of uh, agitation, confusion, or a, a panic-like state. Um, and it's probably more distressing to the parent than the child, especially that first time. Um, so the child is unaware of the episode, and to them, it's even less traumatic than a bad dream. Um, they won't even recall the episode. So it's usually a brief episode uh, lasting a few to several minutes. Um, so sleep terrors can happen spontaneously, and there's uh, often a family history. Uh, but we also know that disruptions from slow wave sleep, such as that caused by an arousal from an apnea event, let's say, uh, that can also trigger more frequent uh, sleep terrors. Um, and so to, to complete this questionnaire, R stands for regularity and duration of sleep. Um, so does your child have a regular bedtime and wake up time? And does it vary by more than an hour on weekends? So what's often overlooked is the benefit of a regular, consistently regular sleep-wake schedule and how that's, uh, very, uh, how that's self-reinforcing. Um, and for duration of sleep, we saw one of the earlier slides outlining the uh, recommended durations of sleep per night, which can help a parent manage expectations about how much their child should be sleeping. And S stands for snoring or sleep disorder breathing. So if there was one question, one question I'd hope gets asked by the provider, it'd be whether the child snores. So does your child snore or have difficulty breathing at night? Um, and that's because snoring is a sign of potential obstructive sleep apnea. Um, and sleep apnea is a medical condition that's more frequent than you might think, affecting two to 3% of the uh, pediatric population. Next slide. So pediatric OSA is very often due to adenotonsillar hypertrophy, and it's most likely to occur from two to six years of age when those tissues are largest in relation to the underlying airway. And here we see an examination view of the uh, tonsillar hypertrophy on the left, where the uvula also happens to be elongated and enlarged. Adenoid hypertrophy, uh, shown on the cartoon on the right, may often be confirmed with the use of nasal endoscopy, uh, which can be done in an ENT's outpatient setting. So with the combination of adenotonsillar hypertrophy, this results in that decreased um, inspiratory airflow. And then you have like subsequent efforts to draw a breath in that become more vigorous. And that can be seen as paradoxical or seesaw breathing, uh, which you'll soon see where on inspiration, the abdomen protrudes out uh, while the chest wall caves in. Next slide. So if there's a suspicion of a medical sleep disorder, uh, especially a breathing related one, then the child and parent may be invited for a in-laboratory one night overnight sleep study. And the technical name for a sleep study is polysomnography, meaning many physiological factors are monitored while a sleep lab technologist stays uh, in attendance overnight as well. And the aim is for a family friendly experience in a hotel style environment um, of course, in a hotel, no one's putting electrodes or sensors on, on the child. Um, remember, it's not a hospital admission. It's still considered an outpatient procedure. Um, there's a full-size bed for the child or a crib for the younger ones. Um, a parent sleeps in a pull-out sleeper chair within the same room. Um, and the child is encouraged to sleep on their own. But if sleep is not occurring, then sometimes we have to relent and allow co-sleeping uh, otherwise, it would be a, a wasted night entirely. Next slide. And this picture shows the uh, standard types of monitoring used in the sleep labs. Uh, this one for a younger child. And you might think, how is my child ever going to sleep with all this on? Um, so we don't expect a child to sleep like they do at home. But really, a large majority of the children are eventually able to sleep, um, and at least for a minimum six, six hours. Um, and none of the attachments uh, are painful or break the skin. Um, at the top, you have a partial EEG, and, and that's paired with electrooculography, or EOG, uh, and chin electromyography, or uh, EMG. And those three are used to determine the sleep staging of non-REM or REM sleep. Um, 
probably the most invasive part of the study um, is an attachment that's placed on the upper lip and directed towards the nostrils um, with what is a nasal cannula type of device called a thermistor. Um, and so this cannula is not giving oxygen, but it's actually a sensor that measures how well the air comes in and out with each breath from either the uh, nose or the mouth. Um, so this is important in detecting regular breathing, um, shallow breathing, or actual pauses in breathing. Um, and then we also have a pulse oximeter that measures oxygenation from a, a finger or a toe probe. Um, and respiratory effort um, is measured by these two black belts uh, on the child that's shown uh, going around the chest and around the belly. And normally, uh, chest and abdominal movement should be in sync. Uh, next slide. You should be hearing a snoring, but you also be hearing pauses in the breathing too. You also notice that the belts are sort of going opposition, opposition to each other. So instead of being in sync, as I mentioned earlier, because of the upper airway obstruction, the child's still trying to you know, breathe past that, but having that paradoxical or seesaw breathing as he attempts to So you can go to the next slide. So the data from a PSG is typically presented in these 30 second panels called EPICS. And there's EOG, e EMG, and e uh, EG data top. But if we focus on the uh, airflow data, you see that um, to the right of that flow, um, it's sort of like a flat line. And then those blue circles are representing that paradigm paradoxical breathing where chest and abdomen uh, belts are sort of going opposition until um, at the end, that big green circle signifies when the child's arousing from that um, apnea. So you're gonna hear, you can hear a <laughs> that sort of you know, uh, gross uh, you know, gasping noise. Um, so this is representative of a 19 second apnea um, where the saturation data shows that it, um, it, even though the child's not hypoxemic uh, by definition, you're seeing, still seeing a oxygen desaturation drop from 96% to 92%. Next slide. So here we look at this spectrum of sleep disorder breathing, where we use polysomnography, um, our gold standard of measurement, uh, to distinguish someone who has true sleep apnea from someone who is just experiencing snoring. And on this rightmost extreme, we have obstructive sleep apnea, uh, with apnea or what's called complete upper airway obstruction. Moving to the next left entity, there's obstructive hypoventilation or hypopnea, where you're not definitively apneic, but you're still having gas exchange derangements, such as lower oxygen saturations or higher carbon dioxide readings. Further back is an entity known as upper airway resistance syndrome, where you're not experiencing true apnea or gas change, exchange abnormalities, but with the frequent arousals, you're having a, a decline or de deterioration of your sleep quality. And then next is what we call uh, primary snoring or habitual snoring, where it's just the noise. And what I tell patients and their families is that they're not in any medical danger, at least they're not at this point uh, with the study. Next slide. So once this diagnosis of sleep apnea is made, adenotonsillectomy is the first line treatment and the most common therapy. Um, so in otherwise healthy children with adenotonsillar hypertrophy, surgery leads to symptomatic improvement and sleep study resolution of the apnea events in a large majority of the patients. Um, obese children may have less satisfactory results, but many will still be treated adequately with adenotonsillectomy. Uh, so it remains part of first line therapy along with rate, weight reduction, which you know, of course will take longer. Um, and so even with surgery being such a favorable option, uh, some degree of post-operative respiratory compromise has been observed in about 15 to 20% of uh, patients who undergo adenotonsillectomy. Um, and that's where the concern is, not only in, in determining 
who might be in need of adenotonsillectomy, but also in determining who might be at risk for the post-operative complications, such as post-obstructive pulmonary edema, uh, or worsening of their upper area obstruction, uh, or the respiratory depression uh, associated with anesthesia. And so these high-risk patients should not undergo outpatient same-day surgery, but should have inpatient post-operative management and monitoring if the diagnostic sleep study indicates severe sleep apnea. Next slide. Okay, moving on from like the much more common obstructive sleep apnea to a rare condition called narcolepsy. Um, highlighting narcolepsy here because uh, recently there's just been a few uh, FDA approved medications to treat it. So it's good to kind of like uh, have an idea what it is. So um, narcolepsy is quite rare. It's estimated about like 200,000 Americans may have narcolepsy. Um, the peak age of presentation is around the mid teenage years, around 14 or 15 years of age. Um, so it's a lifelong neurology disorder of a uh, REM sleep in which there are attacks of irresistible daytime sleepiness, uh, cataplexy that I'll talk about later, hypnagogic um, and hypnopompic hallucinations, meaning like you have hallucinations when you're about to fall asleep or wake up in the morning, uh, sleep paralysis when you're able to move your body uh, if you wake up in the middle of the night, as well as a uh, fragmented night sleep. Next slide. So, um, so the ASM or International uh, Sleep uh, Guidelines uh, help us with this diagnostic criteria for narcolepsy. Um, so, in order to diagnose uh, narcolepsy, they need to have daily periods of uh, irrepressible need to sleep or daytime sleepiness for at least three months, uh, and then you need to have a cataplexy event that. I show your picture of later, uh, as well as when you do a test called multiple sleep latency tests uh, in a sleep lab, um, which will show like a mean sleep latency of less than eight minutes um, and two or more sleep onset RAM periods. Um, the alternative is to do a spinal tap and uh, obtain a CSF hypocortin one uh, level, uh, if it's low, then there's also a uh, diagnostic of narcolepsy. And then there's general two types of narcolepsy, type one and type two. Type one is the one with cataplexy and type two is the one without cataplexy. Next slide, please. So cataplexy is the most specific features of narcolepsy. So it's usually characterized by sudden emotionally triggered episodes of muscle weakness with preserved consciousness. Um, so typically you, uh, get the history about um, a teenager um, you know, not able to last through a joke because as she laughs and then um, she starts to have like speech slurs and, and muscle weakness. So these episodes typically begin with the weakness of the muscles of the face and neck and then spreads through the limbs and then the trunk. Um, their reflexes, if you check them, will be decreased as well. So next slide, please. So the American Academy of Sleep Medicine recently also um, revised the protocols for the diagnostic test, which is the multiple sleep latency test for children. Um, prior to this, uh, we just have like a protocol for both uh, children and adults. Uh, since children need a uh, longer uh, sleep time, so they published this new protocol uh, a few months ago. So, um, so since there are other conditions that can cause daytime sleepiness, um, we need to like make sure that uh, prior to this test, adequate sleep uh, should be documented by using a sleep diary or ideally a uh, actigraphy. And um, if uh, they are on uh, medications, uh, prescription medications, over the counter, hemorrhoids, or any substances that can have like alerting properties, sedating properties, or can affect REM sleep. Um, they should be stopped at least like two weeks before the uh, the NAP test or the MSLT test. Um, and then um, we usually would do a urine tox screen uh, during the night of the sleep test uh, or the day prior uh, to make sure that they are 
um, of all the medications. Next slide, please. So these are some of the medications that can interfere with the uh, sleep architecture. Uh, the examples are adenosine modulators uh, like caffeine, um, alpha 2 delta ligands like galopentin, uh, and antidepressants, which include SSRIs, SNRIs, propion, tricyclic antidepressants, uh, sedating antihistamine, the first generation Benadryl, diphenhydramine, uh, antipsychotic agents, uh, alpha antagonists like prazosine, um, benzodiazepines, um, or the um, or the sopidum, the Z drugs, um, dopamine agonists, a uh, dopamine agonist, um, lithium, melatonin agonist, uh, like rumetion, opioids like morphine, oxidates, uh, sodium oxidate or the low so sodium oxidates. Um, steroids, stimulants, or any weight promoting agents like modafinil. Uh, so all these medications that can interfere with sleep activity will have to be uh, stopped or weaned off uh, around two weeks prior to the test. Moving on, next slide, please. So the American Academy of Sleep Medicine also I uh, want to make sure that uh, they have adequate sleep the night prior to do uh, to doing the nap test in the morning. Um, so uh, children should have at least like eight hours of time in bed with at least seven hours of total sleep time the night prior to the MSLT test. Um, and um, so during the overnight uh, sleep study prior to the MSLT, um, the electronic devices should be turned off at least 30 minutes before the lights up and should not be accessible to the patient uh, after the technician turns off the lights. Um, if you're not familiar with like a MSLT, it's usually uh, we do like the overnight sleep study, um, similar to the one that Dr. Nai was talking about uh, the night prior. And then the next day, um, the patients will be uh, um, asked to try to nap during the daytime uh, with like a, a, in a dark room um, and they'll each be given like a 20 minute uh, nap periods like five times uh, during the day to see whether they are able to fall asleep during this nap periods or not. Next slide, please. So in regards to the the pathophysiology of narcolepsy basically is taught to be due to uh, the loss of like a hypocretin or orexin in your hypothalamus. So orexin helps with the uh, wakefulness, also helps with regulating uh, REM sleep. So if you lose like the orexin, then you go into uh, uh, sleep uh, easier. And then orexin also helps with suppressing REM sleep. So if you lose orexin, then you get intrusion into REM sleep easier. Next slide, please. So there's currently no cure for narcolepsy. And um, the goal of the treatment um, is to uh, enhance alertness, uh, diminish those cataplectic events, enhance daytime functioning, and to improve overall quality of life. Uh, physical exercise has uh, proven to help with the alertness during the day as well in narcoleptics. And they are uh, advised to avoid driving or working near shop or moving machinery. Um, we also uh, try to encourage them to choose their, uh, their, uh, their jobs in the future more carefully um, to avoid like high risk jobs or, um, or night uh, shift work. Um, and in school, there'll be accommodations for uh, by using file plans or IEP plans. Um, and in terms of like uh, medications, so uh, so currently there are like three FDA approved uh, medications for children for narcolepsy. So Xyrum was uh, approved a few years ago, which is the sodium oxidate. Uh, Zywave is the lower uh, sodium uh, form of uh, Xyrum. Sodium oxidate is like 92% less salty. Wake kick is the new kid on the block that was uh, FDA approved a few months ago um, for uh, six years and above. And then there's another 
type of uh, sodium oxalate called luminaries, which is uh, just like a, uh, one, uh, once a night dosing compared to serum, which is a twice a night dosing, which may be approved by the FDA by the uh, end of 2024. Next slide, please. Um, so the other like off-label medications that we often use for uh, treatment of narcolepsy uh, includes like modafinil, amodafinil, um, the traditional stimulants like metaphenidate, um, or Adderall to help with uh, daytime sleepiness. And then for cataplexy, um, we may use uh, antidepressants uh, like SNRIs and uh, SSRIs um, that help uh, suppress REM sleep. Next slide, please. So the medication sodium oxalate or Xyrum and Zywave was approved by FDA following this uh, uh, double blind placebo control uh, randomized trial um, that was done uh, a few years ago. Um, and then this trial has shown that um, uh, the sodium oxalate compared to placebo uh, were able to decrease the weekly number of cataplexy in uh, children uh, seven years and above with cataplexy um, and it sustained over a few weeks of time um, and it also helps decrease the daytime sleepiness in, in the patients. Next slide, please. And in regards to weight kicks or pitolysin, um, so there was this study that was done in Europe uh, in children age six years and older with narcolepsy um, with or without cataplexy using a double-blind randomized post control trial. Uh, they also show uh, improvement in their narcolepsy symptoms compared to placebo, um, as well as uh, helping uh, daytime sleepiness. Next slide, please. I'll take over. So moving on to restless leg syndrome, just quickly going through the American Academy of Sleep Medicine diagnostic criteria. It, basically occurs when a child has some kind of urge to move their legs and that's accompanied by this uncomfortable sensation. It's often worse at night, worse when you're not moving, um, and then movement either partially or fully relieves that uncomfortable sensation. And then you want to make sure it's not being caused by something else. Um, and want to differentiate it from other things like leg cramps or positional discomfort that could mimic restless legs. Next slide. For children, you know, sometimes they are, you know, some of the children you see are younger and even you know, young children can have restless legs. And so the caveats in children are that the child should describe their symptoms in their own words. So it's a little different than adults who say, yes, I have this urge to move my legs. In children, um, it may be that they use words or you have them draw. So this is from a paper from, you know, about a decade ago where they had children draw what they were feeling and, and common themes were children describing the restless legs as, you know, ants crawling on their legs or, feeling like there's a wiggly sensation in their legs, or they may describe it as pain. So it could be confused with growing pains. There is a little overlap there. Um, or, you know, they just feel like they have to move, you know, all these different things um, could point towards restless legs. Next slide. Common mimics would be, um, you know, positional discomfort. Are they sitting on their legs, sore leg muscle, uh, sore leg muscles, having a strain, positional ischemia, um, you know, dermatitis or bruises, or like I said, growing pains. There can be some overlap with restless legs. Um, less common mimics would be, you know, this whole list here. I won't go through all of them, but things like leg cramps um, or having some kind of neuropathy. Next slide, please. There are known risk factors for restless legs, such as a family history. I'd say that's the big one. And, you know, oftentimes when I see patients and I hear something that sounds like it, you know, I'll ask, okay, does anyone else in the family have it? And oftentimes there is a family history, you know, mom, grandparents, whoever it is, it's not always, um, always present, but, but oftentimes there, there is a family history. Female sex is a risk factor. 
And then ferritin less than 50 um, is a risk factor as well. And that would be in someone who's having symptoms of restless legs. So, you know, children without RLS symptoms, if you happen to get a ferritin on them and their ferritin is less than 50, it doesn't mean you automatically need to treat them. Um, but if it's a child with restless legs, then, then, you know, the recommendations are to give iron so that you get that ferritin above 50. And it's thought that individuals with restless legs have lower um, brain iron stores. And also iron can be related to dopamine pathways. And so this combination of um, sort of lower or affected dopamine levels and lower brain iron stores can lead to the restless leg symptoms. Other things that can um, cause or worsen restless legs would be medications like antihistamines, um, some of the centrally acting dopamine receptor antagonists, antidepressants, except for bupropion or Wellbutrin. Um, these are just things that in someone who's susceptible to restless legs, it may worsen their symptoms. Another thing would be if a child gets a sleep study and they have elevated periodic limb movements of sleep on the sleep study, meaning they're moving their legs a lot during the study and it's periodic, um, that could also be as, um, associated with restless legs. Next slide. Management um, for me is checking CBC, iron studies, and ferritin. You know, some places just check ferritin, but personally, I like to see the iron studies to see, okay, what's the percent saturation? Is there room to give iron? And then you aim for a ferritin above 50. Um, for younger children, it's three milligrams per kilogram of the elemental iron for two to three months. I max out at the sort of teenager adolescent dosing of 65 milligrams elemental iron. And then an older, you know, children and adolescents for adults, I just, you can just give them 65 milligrams elemental iron a day for two to three months and then recheck labs. If their ferritin is good and they're still having symptoms or they have symptoms of RLS, then there are medications we can use such as gabapentin or clonidine, but you always want to target that ferritin level first. Next slide. Restless sleep disorder is a new disorder. It was only um, characterized a couple of years ago. And for this, it's um, really that a child is having restless sleep that's not caused by something else. And to diagnose it, you would have to technically do a sleep study where you identify five or more gross body movements, so big body movements um, during the night, um, and that's five or more movements per hour on the sleep study. Next slide. This is just um, a diagram, just when you think about a child who's having restless sleep, if it's primary, that would be restless sleep disorder, meaning you see this restless sleep, it's not caused by something else, it's causing daytime impairment, versus secondary, meaning the restless sleep is caused by something else and you'd wanna treat that, such as STB as sleep disorder breathing, so like sleep apnea, um, PLMD, periodic limb movement disorders, having a lot of limb movements, maybe seizures, RLS, parasomnias, so like um, sleep terrors, or um, you know, confusion arousals, medical disorders like asthma, eczema, neurodevelopmental or psychiatric disorders, um, or um, you know, maybe in older kids, hopefully not younger ones, smoking. Um, but you may see that in the teenagers. Next slide. Management um, is actually similar to restless legs when it comes to iron. So the pathophysiology is not actually fully known in restless sleep disorder, but again, it's thought to be related to low, br um, low brain iron stores. And so it'd be the same thing as restless legs, looking at the CBC iron studies in ferritin and trying to get that ferritin above 50. Next slide. Last, last part, and then we'll answer questions. Um, so, you know, I know in your practices, you um, treat children with autism spectrum disorder. And I just wanted to touch on this quickly because sleep problems are more, co more common in children with autism. And it's not just a one size fits all. It can be anything from falling or staying asleep to having these early morning awakenings or not sleeping enough or having irregular sleep wake patterns. And as you've probably seen, it can worsen daytime function and behavior. As far as the etiology, um, there are multiple factors. Some of those could be that um, there are abnormal melatonin pathways in, in the brains of children with autism, um, just having to do with synthesis and secretion. Then some children, they have circadian clock genes with abnormalities. And then another contributor could be social or environmental cues and just not being able to, um, you know, sort of um, pick up on those cues that, that help your brain um, understand it's time for sleep. Next slide. 
Oh, these are a lot of slides, so I'll just go, I'll just go through them very quickly. So there was a paper in the past few years from the American Academy of Neurology that addressed um, melatonin and what to do for sleep difficulties in children with autism. And really the take home points are that, you know, you want to look for other factors that could be affecting their sleep, like, you know, reflux or sleep apnea or, you know, eczema, and you want to treat those factors. And then the first step is to look at behavioral treatments. So try and understand what's the sleep routine, like sleep hygiene, all of these things before jumping to medication. Sometimes you can, you know, do melatonin while you're doing behavioral interventions, but you don't want to forget about, um, again, just that those good sleep environment and all those pieces before going to medicines. Next slide. And, you know, the big thing is that for any child, there aren't any FDA approved medications for sleep. Um, and so everything we do is really off label, even using melatonin. As far as dosing, um, you want to start low. Um, really, you should be using one to three milligrams, 30 to 60 minutes for bedtime. This is in children with autism and titrate to effect. A bigger dose is not always better. So I, you know, you don't want to go really, really high because it doesn't mean it's going to help more and it can also become toxic. Um, in this paper, they say don't exceed 10 milligrams. Really, that would be in adolescence, I would say. In younger children, I'm really trying to stay in, in the lower range. Next slide. Um, and just in for any child, you know, melatonin is over the counter. It comes in many different forms. It's not, it's a supplement, so it's not FDA regulated. And so you want to be careful with, again, dosing. And um, some brands have this USP label that says, you know, uh, organization has looked at what's um, the, you know, what's in on the labels, what's actually in the melatonin, but that's sometimes harder to find in, you know, gummies and other things. So, um, you know, again, you just want to be careful with that and use the lowest dose possible. The timing of melatonin is important, which I'll talk about on the next slide. And, you know, just a reminder that, you know, it's not necessarily a magic pill. Um, you really want to target it more in children who are at higher risk for sleep issues like autism, ADHD, you know, in, in any child who's having sleep problems, you want to understand the behavioral side of things before jumping to melatonin, um, just because we, you know, uh, you know, we also don't know about long term side effects. Um, there is a question, does it affect puberty? However, you know, recent study really disavowed that, you know, it said that it does not. Um, but, you know, again, you, you um, don't want to use it if you don't need to and just be careful with the dosing. Next slide. And this is the last one. Um, with dosing, like I mentioned, if you're looking at sleep onset, you want to do one to three milligrams 30 minutes before bed, can increase to five to six milligrams if needed. And then that max 10 milligram is in a much older child. Sleep maintenance, they do sell a prolonged release melatonin, but you can't crush the pills. That would just be in children who can swallow pills. And then if you're looking to shift a sleep cycle, like in a teenager has a delayed sleep schedule, like a night owl, you would use earlier doses, earlier and lower doses earlier in the night, like 0.5 to 2 milligrams two hours before the desired bedtime. Next slide. Great. Thank you so much. That was an amazing uh, presentation. In the last two minutes, we do have a couple of questions in our Q&A. So the first is from uh, Lorraine Bork. Can you speak to the uh, use of white noise machines or quiet music as part of bedtime routine? Who would like to take on this question? Um, I'll have my two cents in about this. Um, okay, yeah. You talked about having a cool, quiet, dark environment for the kids, um, and for anyone for that matter. Um, but I'm not opposed to having the uh, sound machines, the white noise machines used. Um, the caveat being, um, we all go to sleep in a certain way. So if you were going to have a sound machine, I think you would probably want it not to time out because when we go to sleep, it's not we, like we go into a coma. We do wake up a little bit. So if you wake up, you want to try to reestablish the conditions in which you fell asleep. So if you had this sound machine or noise machine on as you were going to sleep, I would prefer it, that it stays on for the, the remainder of the night. Great. Thank you, uh, Dr. Nye. Uh, the next question from Robert Acosta. How useful are the current crop of consumer sleep monitoring devices? Uh, Dr. Smith, anything you would like to add to this? Yeah, so um, this is a common question we get because so many people have an Apple Watch or, or other device. With these, um, we don't actually have the access to the algorithms. 
And so what I usually say is they're helpful if you're looking at total sleep time, like, you know, being able to track patterns, going to bed, waking up, how much sleep. But I would say, you know, we don't know how accurate they are when it goes into the different sleep stages. So you'll see things like you were in REM sleep, you were in non-REM sleep. Really, the only way to truly identify that would be if you are hooked up to an EEG during a sleep study or an EEG. And so that I would be a little more cautious about um, reading into those parts of it. But for total sleep time, they're pretty good. Great. Thank you so much. Let me, may I, add uh, to that? I mean, let me add to that for a second. Um, yeah. I mean, it's uh, those those monitors are really on the premise of what we used to we, what we still use is something called actigraphy, which basically uh, movement monitors or, or uh, motion monitors. So um, it's nothing new in that sense. Um, I did forget to put uh, mention that, you know, uh, for teenagers, at least for 13 and older, we do have home sleep tests that are uh, much uh, easier to use. It's no longer involving a lot of sensors. It, it's as simple as a pulse oximeter, as well as you know maybe one uh, band around your chest, um, and it takes away from the ev invasiveness of, of the uh, um, near the face. Um, so that can be done in uh, as a home sleep ther a home sleep test uh, for children uh, without comorbid conditions if they're 13 uh, years or older. Thank you. Great, thank you, Dr. Nye. Another question, uh, Dr. Tan: How close to bedtime should children stop physical activity? Um, so in regards to like physical activities, uh, our, our body needs to like cool down uh, before sleep can occur. Um, so um, I generally uh, recommend like children to um, start winding down like an hour, two hour, hours before bedtime. And in regards to like a really uh, uh, intense physical activities, they should stop like uh, having like sports games or practices like two or three hours before bedtime. Okay, very good, thank you. Uh, Dr. Smith, fairly good data to support the validity of wearable heart rate EKG monitors in detection of dysrhythmias. What is the validity of wear wearable sleep monitors that many smart watches advertise any pediatric data? You know, I actually don't know. I don't know what the, you know, the research behind that. And I, I'm not sure with EKGs. I don't know if anyone else has seen anything. Yeah, I, I don't think, uh, I mean, uh, I know Dr. Wong um, is asking about, you know, its use. Um, it's been... I think the Samsung algorithm and the Apple algorithm is mostly in adults. Um, I haven't seen any like, evidence in pediatrics yet. Um, the only FDA approved um, um, wearable kind of like a home sleep testing will be like the watch pad. Um, currently there aren't any other FDA approved devices for pediatric population. Yeah, Samsung has just released their Galaxy Watch and they have sleep, uh, they're purported to you know, test for sleep apnea. It's still not to replace um, uh, the diagnosis of a clinician though, uh, but that is something that is now on the market uh, for sleep apnea. Great, excellent. Uh, Dr. Tan from Dr. Knockley, um, can you comment specifically on available genetic markers for narcolepsy and how these results are positive can direct therapy or outcomes? So um, so the HLA-DQB0602 uh, genotype is found to uh, be quite specific in uh, people with uh, type one narcolepsy, uh, especially those with uh, cataplexy. Um, so around like 80 uh, 90 or 90% 90 or more uh, of people with uh, type one narcolepsy would have the uh, that HLA DQB0602 gene, gene. Um, but it's not a very sens uh, uh, sensitive test because um, I guess it's very sensitive, but it's not very specific because 25% of normal population will have that gene too. So if, it, uh, if, the, if the patients have that gene, then it is uh, um, uh, suggestive of narcolepsy. So it's a good test to rule out, but not a good test to rule in basically. Great. Um, Dr. Uh, Nye, um, thoughts on clonidine for sleep for kids with ASD or ADHD? Yeah, I think Dr. Uh, uh, Stacy had you know, mentioned that um, on children who may not be doing that well on with melatonin, uh, either the clonidine or uh, Neurontin, um, gabapentin should uh, may be used. Got it, great, excellent. And Dr. Smith, last question. Can you provide more insight regarding nightmares, night terrors, and vivid imagination? 
Um, so, you know, all, so nightmares and night terrors or sleep terrors can, you know, occur just sort of normally if, if they're not happening very often in children. You want to worry if children are having them more and more frequently or if they're persisting, um, you know, they're really not getting better. Then you want to look into other sleep disorders. So something like sleep apnea or restless legs or periodic limb movements that may be um, exacerbating these, these events. Um, the other thing would be not getting enough sleep. So you, so you want to dive a little deeper. As far as vivid, well, the last one was vivid imagination. Was that? Or, yeah. Yep. Vivid imagination. Um, yeah. I, you know, I don't, I don't know if I have, you know, I'm not sure how that, if that necessarily ties in, I will say, um, like Dr. Nye mentioned, you know, for some children, the, um, you know, you'll see worse breathing or worse sleep apnea and REM sleep, and that's when you're dreaming. So, you know, if someone is really remembering their dreams, you could think about looking into screening for sleep apnea, because it might be that they're disrupting their REM sleep and then waking up and remembering those dreams. Great. Excellent. Well, thank you all. I know that we're over time, but uh, this was a fantastic discussion. Have a wonderful day. And uh, yes, you will be getting the um, link for the recording as well. Take care, everyone. Bye.